Hey there everyone, Steve the Amateur Historian, and I'm here. I'm right here, right where it all began. Case in point, I'm standing along Ainsworth Street in Northeast Portland, uh, between 36th Avenue down there and 35th Place right up there. And I'm right before this second tree from the end of this island. This exact spot on the street is where the first opening shot from the 2003 Gus Van Sant film Elephant begins. This is where it all started. It's just a car driving westbound along this stretch. That's how it all started. However, the story behind the film itself has a lot more to it before it actually started. It's been called shocking, boring, powerful, pointless. Depends who you ask, because everyone's gonna have a difference of opinion. The pretentious crowd thinks you can find God while watching it, whereas the crowd with no attention span calls it a waste of 80 minutes. Its reviews from your basic everyday crowd are so polarizing that I'm not gonna waste my time with it. I would call this picture neither iconic nor worthless. But one thing I cannot deny is that it was a real raw slice of human life that I personally grew up with. I identify with the look of it. I knew people that were in it. It touched on subject matter that pushing 20 years on is still relevant. In fact, several times more so. And it happened in my city. Yep, all the pieces came together, and I definitely think it's the right time and place to take a look back at the 2003 cinematic creation that was Gus Van Sant's Elephant. Mom's gonna kill you. What? What are you doing? Dad, I'm driving. Get out of the car, Dad. How's it going? This is, uh, this is not going to do it. These long pants. Everybody else is wearing shorts. What's the matter? I don't want to talk about it. He's so cute. So cute. He has a girlfriend? Mm hmm Since when? You didn't know that? No. Okay. Oh, great. The question. What they do um, is that they will sit up in this higher energy state. Where are you riding? Oh, this? Yeah. It's my plan. For what? Oh, uh, you'll see. What are you doing? He's got to come back. Hey, sir, don't go in. Sir, don't go in there. Don't, trust me, just don't go in there, please. What's up, everybody? I just got off at this bus stop near 42nd 
and Killingsworth, specifically because I have something pretty cool to show you. Something that is right over here. At the time in which this film began production, depicting life in a fictitious American high school, I was barely into my junior year of high school. Described justifiably as a psychological drama, the film Elephant follows several high school students of various backgrounds and cliques during what initially appears to be just another day at school. The film plays a lot with real time, as there are numerous lengthy shots tracking with various characters as they go about their day. But we also witness the same periods of time from the perspectives of multiple people, allowing us to capture a real flavor as to when certain events are transpiring. And all of this is building up to the shocking conclusion of the film, wherein, spoilers, two students loosely based on Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold, arrive armed to the teeth. Harris and Claybold are infamously remembered as the two students who shot up Columbine High School in Colorado back in 1999. At the time, it was the worst school shooting in American history. And at the time Elephant began shooting, just a little over three years later, such was still the case. When the film ends, there is no catharsis, there is no relief, there is no cartoon ending. We are merely left with the main shooter menacingly reciting "Eeny, meeny, miny, mo." When the film cuts to the credits a split second before he presumably executes what could be described as a popular couple at the school. The fact that one of the killers is the last person we see standing is powerful in showing the dark reality of school shootings wherein good people have lost their lives. Elephant was regarded as the second of three films Van Sant did in what was called his Death Trilogy. The first in the series, Jerry, starred Casey Affleck and Matt Damon, and was released in early 2002 with the production of Elephant starting in the fall of that same year. The final film in the series, Last Days, is based loosely on the final days of Kurt Cobain's life. That would be released in 2005. So Elephant was obviously the middle film in this death trilogy and I've never actually seen Jerry or Last Days but even just looking up stills from the film I could see immediate correlations between the shooting style of Elephant in correlation to these other two films that were shot around it um, for this series there was a definite correlation um, in the look and feel of them so of course to no one's surprise when I looked up uh, cinematography or who's the director of photography on Elephant, same guy that did Jerry and Last Days. Also did Zodiac, so... In the early planning, however, the Elephant Project was originally set to be a documentary before that plan was dropped. Van Sant would write and edit the film, along with directing it. However, interestingly enough, the outline of the film's plot would be based on a short story written by Harmony Corrine, director of such films as Gummo, Spring Breakers, and, a little more recently, The Beach Bum. Corrine and Van Sant were close friends, and they worked together in terms of structuring what would ultimately become this film. Actress Diane Keaton was also directly involved in the film from the very start, serving as one of its producers. Very affected by the events of Columbine, Keaton pursued Van Sant from almost right after the shooting happened to try and produce something in relation to those events at Columbine. And it was no surprise that Van Sant would want to use a Portland high school for this production. As a Portland native who went from an obscure independent filmmaker in the city during the 1980s to an Oscar-nominated director by the late 90s, but he always managed to come back to Portland. Only four years after Elephant, Van Zant would produce another comparable indie-style Portland-based high school film with Paranoid Park. This film starred a kid named Gabe Nevins, who just happened to go to the same high school as me. The name for the film, Elephant, 
got its inspiration from a 1989 short film directed by Alan Clark. This bleak and dark film that follows a succession of murders happening in Northern Ireland was produced for television on the BBC Two, where it was shown in January of 1989. Only a year and a half later, Clark would pass away at the age of 54 from complications due to lung cancer. It was felt that the use of the title Elephant in Clark's film was in reference to the parable of the blind men and the elephant, which implies we are all touching different parts of the same elephant. Translation, we are all living with our own truths, which are relative, and thus we need to be open to and understanding towards the truths of others. We need to be open to communication and understanding to the lives and experiences others have. This, in essence, can be felt in the story that Van Sant brings us as we are witnessing many different young people all living their own lives with their own realities. One can even say the shooter at the end of the film were driven to such actions by the dismissal of their realities by their fellow classmates. However, Alan Clark's film did not derive its title from The Blind Men and the Elephant Parable. It was actually derived from the concept of the, quote, elephant in the room. This idiom addresses the situational concept where there is a clear issue that everyone present is aware of, but nobody wants to actually address. While Clark's film had its inspiration in terms of the actual style and pacing of the film, Van Sant was also influenced by the 1975 Belgian film Jean Dielman, 23, Commerce Quay, 1080, Brussels. The film, clocking in at 201 minutes, follows a mother as she engages in, among other things, the mundane tasks of her daily life. This tracking of mundane activities can definitely be seen in Elephant, especially in the numerous shots throughout that show various students as they simply pass through the halls of their school. With production getting closer and closer, one critical decision that Van Zant made in relation to the film was to cast all of his high school leads with local kids who had little to no acting experience. Obviously then, casting calls were made, not just in the Portland area where the film was shot, but in various other parts of Oregon. Some teens who got tiny roles in the film came from various parts of central and southern Oregon. I encountered this casting call directly, but alas, didn't pay close enough attention to really knowing what it was all about. But she did. See that girl? That's Lisa. I went to high school with her, and she was in a media communications class with me. And it's funny, I, I did and I didn't know that this film existed. And what I mean by that is, this film was shot when I was an upperclassman in high school, it's one of the reasons, among other things, that I have such a deep connection to it, along with the fact that like people I knew were in it. Um, I was interested in like the psychology of school shootings at the time. And it was a film being done by a really prominent director. You know, this is the guy that did Goodwill Hunting just a few years earlier. And it was being shot at a Portland high school using real high schoolers while I'm a high schooler. So, I mean, there was obvious, obvious connections. And I remember I was in a media communications class and our teacher came in one day and said, hey, um, there's like a film that's gonna be uh, happening in Portland and you know, they want a bunch of high schoolers. So if you're interested, eh, there's your opportunity. That was all the information we got. She didn't tell us it was a Gus Van Sant film. She didn't tell us it was this movie Elephant. She didn't tell us, and maybe, maybe she didn't know all those details. I really don't know. And so, you know, I was really introverted. So I was like, oh, that'd be kind of fun, but nah. And actually one of the girls in, my, in that media comp class was in Elephant. She was a background character in the cafeteria real briefly. So I didn't, you know, I didn't respond. I didn't react. I didn't try to figure out more about it. And I didn't realize that that was this movie. And I didn't even know this movie had been made. Because I just, I don't know, I didn't follow anything back then. You know, I really didn't. So Lisa, unlike myself, actually paid attention and got a spot in the film, which only made sense. When we had our own little Oscar knockoff show in our media class, she won like four awards. But hey, at least I won Best Cameraman and gave the greatest acceptance speech of all time. 
And the winner is Steve Poole. But anyway, long story short, I missed my opportunity, and as a matter of fact, I didn't even know of this film's existence until the spring of 2005, because again, when we got the casting call, I didn't pay attention to what it, the project it was even being made for. So, yeah, I didn't even know about the film that I missed. You know what? Let's just move along. I started college in the fall of 2004, and in the spring of 2005, I took um, a fiction writing class. And the teacher I had was really into local independent film. The, my film, uh, the guy that ran the film department at my college was like friends with him, and I remember he was in a film that my, my fiction teacher was in a film that my the film program guy did, because he's also a film director. And, even though it was a writing class, randomly at the end of the term, like the next to last day, he was like, we're gonna watch a movie. We're gonna watch this movie called Elephant. And I'm like, okay, we're gonna watch a movie. And then he explained the details. It was filmed in Portland. It was done in 2003. It was done by Gus Van Sant. It was a film about school shootings, which are horribly tragic, but it's something that I've always been, you know, interested in. You know, it's like why somebody would be interested in true crime. You know, it's dark, but you can have an interest in it. And so this was a complete shock, like that this film even existed to me by the spring of 2005, even though my, our teacher had actually said, hey, they're doing auditions for this film and that film turned out to be Elephant, I found out later on. So I like knew the film existed, but I didn't. And that was the first time I ever saw the film Elephant was in that fiction class. And I, I, was, I was enthralled the whole time. Again, because of the reasons I've mentioned already. It, it, it was just, I didn't know this existed, and it, and it just, so it threw me for a loop. The year 2002, when Elephant was actually shot, was done during a time of great turmoil amidst Portland's public schools. I remember that very well. I was going to Rex Putnam High School in Milwaukee, just south of Portland during this time, and I remember being super grateful that I wasn't going to a Portland public school at that time. And it was during this turmoil that Gus Van Sant needed a school as the main setting for his film. A real school. And fortunately, only a year earlier, the city relocated students from what was once Whitaker Middle School. This left their former building vacant in 2002, and Van Sant had his shooting location. This particular school building used in the film, however, was demolished back in 2007. The location where the school once stood is today just an open field with some scattered, nondescript trails running through it. Right, the creme de la creme, the site of the school itself. It was given the fictitious title Watt High School in the film. And it's still, this isn't my first time here, but it's still crazy just to think I'm walking through Watt High School right now. Like I'm standing in a classroom or Maybe the gym, maybe the cafeteria, maybe a hallway that you see in the film. It was all right here from at least the edge of the ridge here, probably going back a little ways this way, at least halfway towards 42nd Avenue, which is on the other side there and stretched off all the way this way. And then right here, up closer to the street, up closer along, uh, what used to be 39th, but is Cesar Chavez now. And especially now, 
it's, it's really interesting to think about a bunch of kids walking down this sidewalk, coming from over there, maybe coming from the other side to go to the school <laughs> right here. Where did it go? Well, actually, I know the story behind why the school is no longer here, so I'll bring that to you right now. This land in northeast Portland was, like lots of land in the area back in the day, primarily farmland, except for the land where Fernhill Park is today, just north of the school's former site. The general area was also known to serve as an unofficial dumping area with lots of locals ditching their trash there. Over time, by the 1950s, much of this once open land had been filled in by homes and extended streets surrounding Fern Hill Park. And by 1964, the plans for a new high school had been established to be constructed right in this location, which was understandably met with severe backlash from locals as it would mean the taking away and demolishing of 26 homes on the site. This tragically was a very common practice in Portland during the 1950s and 60s where hundreds of homes in the city would be demolished for the sake of, quote, progress. Despite the local protests, the plans to build a new school went forward. The building, which served as fictitious Watt High School in Elephant, originally opened as John Adams High School in 1969. Interestingly enough, it had a 42nd Avenue address, but in Elephant, the front of the school is facing Cesar Chavez Boulevard, or what used to be 39th Avenue. The school was reportedly open to alleviate the number of students in other Northeast Portland high schools. Integration also played a role in the establishment of Adams, as there was a massive imbalance of students of color spread through Portland's Northeastern schools at the time. From the outset, Adams was a controversial school as they became one of only a handful of schools in the nation to become part of what was called the Educational System for the 70s. This system allowed for the pursuit of a new curriculum which was very much predicated on hands-on learning and out-of-school experiences. The school also functioned on a system similar to the U.S. government, at least how it's supposed to be, which allowed for a semblance of checks and balances. This setup actually sometimes allowed students to override their teacher's authority. Despite their revolutionary and innovative approaches to education, the school struggled from the outset, and even after only a few years, the projected number of students at the school dropped. By 1981, facing serious issues of low enrollment, Portland needed to close some schools. They decided to close George Washington High School in southeast Portland, and they closed down John Adams right along with it. In 1983, the school reopened as Whitaker Middle School, relocating from an older school site. The school would be used as Whitaker for almost two decades before, as they say, the bottom fell out. The end of the 2001 school year at Whitaker had to be one of the darkest moments in Portland's educational history. A scathing account in the Willamette Week in May 2001 referred to Whitaker as the worst middle school in the state of Oregon. But that was only the beginning of their troubles. The building itself was becoming run down with the classic stains in the ceiling tiles and mouse droppings, and even an atrium that was so damaged that students could not safely enter it anymore. An inspection of the school revealed radon gas at levels that were almost three times higher than the level that would require action to be taken by federal law. Radon gas has been tied to causes of lung cancer. Also, high levels of carbon dioxide were detected in the building. CO2 has been linked to various other health effects on the student body, but specifically in this case, it can have negative effects on one's performance. Whitaker just happened to have some of the lowest test scores in the state at that time. And it also had the highest number of student absences of all schools in the city of Portland. Because the school was probably making kids sick all the time. Furthermore, the school had been originally built with windows that did not open. God only knows why. 
which meant these gases were being trapped inside this poorly ventilated educational environment. If that wasn't enough to piss a parent off, it was found that tests had revealed high levels of radon gas at Whitaker dating all the way back to 1990, 11 years earlier. The heads of the school knew this and kept everyone in the dark about it. The Willamette Week piece let the cat out of the bag and parents were infuriated so much that even after the school was closed and follow-up tests were done that showed the radon levels had dropped considerably, more than 200 kids were still kept away from the school by their distrusting parents. Who could blame them? An analysis of what it would take to fully fix up the school revealed it would take months to fix and cost millions of dollars. The school district fell on the cheaper option and just moved the kids back to the original Whitaker Middle School building. So, in essence, the school's neglect ended up being Gus Van Sant's gain. After being used for the film shoot in later 2002, the school building would remain vacant for the most part, allowing it to decay even further. Radon gas continued to be a problem while... Over time, black mold began to grow, becoming even more of a financial and biological catastrophe. The conclusion was finally drawn in 2007 to demolish the school and get rid of the problem altogether. While the vast majority of the film would be shot at the old Whitaker Middle School, there were a few pieces shot outside of that primary location. And that takes us right back to where we started. So we're back right at the site where it all began, which was the car carrying John and his father, starting, you know, right about here, right next to where this vehicle is parked on the side of the road. And they were traveling westbound in this direction, which is interesting because if you know this area, you'll know that the location of the school that was used in the film is actually a couple blocks this direction. But of course, through the magic of film, you wouldn't necessarily know that. So let's walk that little stretch that John and his father go down when the film starts. So John's with his father. His father is clearly drunk and swerving around. And right at about this point, between pretty much between this tree and this tree, there is a car parked right here that John's father sideswipes and knocks the rear view mirror off as he's kind of swerving around in the middle of the street. They then come up to this fairly open intersection. This is 35th place crossing Ainsworth. And right as the dad gets to this intersection, there's a bicyclist coming from this direction and the bicyclist crosses paths, which is interesting because you, you'd think he's just going to continue this direction, but there's actually no street going this way. And John's father has to stop abruptly right as he gets to this intersection. And then they continue processing forth up Ainsworth towards 35th Avenue. Doing some more kind of back and forth swerving they then manage to weave their way through 35th and Ainsworth and after they make it through this intersection the father starts swerving this way and I remember because this house with four windows is right off to their side they start swerving towards the curb and there used to be a sign here that said 33rd Avenue next signal that sign is now gone however the father is going directly towards this power pole this power pole is seen in the film and he starts driving right towards it and at the last second he swerves and parks right about where this Volkswagen is stopped So at this point, the car is stopped. 
John gets out of the car, surveys the damage, makes some comment to the effect of like, mom's gonna kill you because you messed up the car. You see the father, he's, you know, drunk as hell. And he's like, nah, dad, get out, I'm driving. <laughs> and the dad's just kind of like, what's the problem? And they switch places, John gets in the driver's seat and they start driving. And John continues driving westbound, same direction that they went, or were traveling already. And this is 34th Avenue, where we actually see shortly after they take off from where they were parked again, right, right here. They drive a little ways and then turn, so perceivably John turns them down 36th Avenue, or sorry, 34th Avenue, uh, traveling this direction. And again, the actual school in the film is roughly this way. So, you know, they just wanted a nice little stretch to drive down, it seems. I also noticed while walking around here, right after you go through 35th place, this is right where the bicycle accident almost happened. One of the trees has been cut down, the second one down from the intersection. I can only assume this tree was still here when they were filming, but you know, aside from the trees seeming, at least by memory to me, to be a lot more in bloom than I remember, and the likelihood that this tree was still here back in 2003, it, you know, it kind of looks the same, except in the film, this house right here, it's kind of a mint green color now. I remember it being kind of a purple. It was a shade of purple in the film because it kind of sticks out a little bit as they're driving down this road because it's kind of an elongated house. Uh, but I remember it being purple and this is a mint green now. So slight changes, but not much. The former school site sits on a massive property that connects to a park called Fernhill Park. This park space was used to introduce us to the second student that we see in the film, a photographer named Elias. We first see him stopping a couple in the park and photographing them. I knew when I visited the park site I wanted to find the exact spot where this encounter took place, as well as discovering its relevance to the location of the school. So I'm in Fernhill Park, and I think I found the marker that I set for myself. There's a, see, kind of an oblong tree. And I think, I think this is the tree. Yep, I think that's the one. See, there's a gathering of leaves here. So there's like a divot. That would be right there. There's two trees in the distance. Yeah. That's the tree. So I found my guiding marker. I was like, I'll find the spot if I can find this tree. So from the opening scene with John and his drunken father, we're introduced to the character of Elias. Um, a lot of characters don't get introduced till they're in the school, and obviously the school's gone, so I can't take you exactly to where they were introduced, but these are, these are the characters that were introduced to outdoors. So, from probably about this direction, directly behind me, this general area back here would have been where we first see Elias approaching. And it's not too far from the tree, so probably pretty close to where I'm standing. There's the tree. Right in this general area is where he would have encountered the couple, asked to take pictures of them, took a few, and they part ways. The couple kind of goes off this way, and Elias starts going off towards the school, which would be way off in this distance. And as he walks, you see him walk in close proximity 
to this tree, going around it, and heading off towards the school that way. And after the introduction of Elias, or Eli as he's referred to in the film, we return to John's character, finally bringing us inside the school building itself. John pulls into the parking lot and rushes to the school to make a phone call before his drunken father wanders off. Upon this initial arrival at the school, we are exposed to the only pieces of the site that still remain today. This is another of what are very few remains of the school that used to be here. This would have been the gate that, you know, uh, after hours would have been locked up, keeping unwanted people from going into the school. But this would have been uh, one of the entryways. You can actually see how the ground is lowered here so that cars could pull in. You would have pulled right through here. And this would have been the uh, driveway in front of the school. And John and his dad would have pulled in here, turned, pulled up, and parked, you know, somewhere in this vicinity when he would have got out and approached the school building right here. And you know, Wikipedia's telling me it was on 42nd over there. Um, and then they refer to it as the old Whitaker Middle School site because that was the middle school. It was the last um, school to actually be in this area. They referred to that campus as being on 39th, which is right here. But it was the same building. Um, so I'm searching and I'm going through clips and uh, of the movie because I'm trying to figure out where the hell's the entrance to the school. And uh, near the beginning, um, this part right here where you see John uh, pulling in with his dad. His dad's drunk and he's getting out of the car to go into the school telling his dad to stay there. And if you look in the background, um, you see two cream colored houses. So I thought like, okay, well maybe I can find one of those houses. So I'm going up and down 42nd way over there. There's really nothing. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, God, I hope all these houses haven't been torn down since the movie was done. Um, so I come over here to 39th, and I'm searching around, and one of the things I noticed was that this one of the cream-colored houses had a very thin window on it. And if you look at the cream-colored house behind me, uh, just this side of the pole, you'll notice there on the front or part of it, there's that really thin little sliver of a window kind of by the main door. And then I was like, okay, that's got to be the place. And I looked up and down the windows, I realized that's it. And you see it behind their car when they're pulling into the driveway, which is where I'm standing right now, is right on the driveway. So I'm guessing either these trees were on the other side of it, or they parked somewhere along here, because you can see that house right there in the background of the shot when they pull up and park. So of course I'm having to guesstimate based on memory and just general thinking that they were probably parked somewhere in this area. Which means the entryway to the school would have been like right, right over here. Again, you know, maybe I'm off. Maybe it's 
maybe the, the main entry was here, or the main entry was there, but right about here would have been, you'd get out of the vehicle and walk up to the building. metal sticking out of the ground. I don't know if that's a relic of the old school, but yes. uh, there's something. Looking way down in that direction, we've got another uh, old gate that was obviously used to get on the property somewhere. It's located more down by the football field and I can only assume that along with this that this is also probably I mean it's painted the same color it's definitely aged I can only assume that this is also something that was original to the uh, school when it was here And then of course, uh, over here, and I'm thinking this probably was more practical in terms of uh, actually leading into a parking lot, which I'm assuming there, there had to be more parking back here. There just had to be. So I'm now approaching, this is 42nd Street, uh, intersection with Killingsworth right there. And lo and behold, we have another tragically forgotten uh, gate back here on the opposite side of the school. This one's even more kind of obscure than the one at the head of the school. There's literally this tree is practically growing into it. But yeah, it's the exact same type of gate with this little thing on the top, chained off in the middle. The film is the antithesis of the common high school film, which often have a logical focus on coming-of-age experiences and learning more about life. Most of these films are comedies like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Mean Girls, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and Superbad. Most other high school films, while a little more serious, are still often a mix of comedy and drama, such as Dazed and Confused. Lady Bird, and Say Anything. And then there's... Carrie? Hey, that's a high school film. Of course, no discussion of the cinematic rendering of high school life is complete without referencing the master himself, John Hughes. I was a late arrival in watching The Breakfast Club for the first time, and I expected to have a bleh opinion of it because everybody else talked about how amazing it was. But... In a rare case, I found myself even more blown away by its kooky, heartfelt comedy and how brilliantly it addressed the issues of cliques and how they separate us. And he did this years and years before most other filmmakers were even touching on the same subject matter. Elephant, in fitting in with this high school film dynamic, is almost remarkable for how non-comedic it actually is. The only time the film has ever gauged a laugh from me, it's been simply out of relating to something that occurs in it, or seeing somebody I knew in the film. It, I've never so much as chuckled at the subject matter. It's not that nothing funny ever happens in the film. I mean, there's great little gems, such as this one. Yeah, how many weeks have you had? I don't, I don't understand, because like, everyone else thinks I'm a good singer, and... 
a couple weeks ago when I sang Star Spangled Banner, everyone thought it was like really good. So that's why I'm like really confused that you would say something like that. Seriously, I mean, why? Why do you think I'm such a bad singer? But the film tries to present the daily high school experience in such a realistic manner that when you see something funny, you're more reflective in your relation to it as opposed to just laughing out loud at the subject matter. This really separates Elephant from most high school films where, even in the more serious ones, there's moments that seem clearly put in just to elicit a little bit of laughter. But this is extremely rare in Elephant. The realism of the daily high school experience is so blatantly thrown in our face that we have numerous shots that last minutes and consist primarily of just following characters around. Altogether, there were only 88 shots used in the film, and almost half of those come during the film's climax in the last 15 minutes. This element of the film's cinematography is, arguably, the most polarizing issue in the film, and definitely the thing I hear complained about the most. It's boring. The pacing of the film is considered too slow by many, which I feel misses the point of why it's structured the way that it is. Granted, most people like to criticize before critically thinking, so... Each lengthy sequence develops our given character and shows us how they are, what they are like, and what they have to deal with on a daily basis. But, given the fact that the film itself is only 81 minutes long, it's easy to feel like time is being wasted, or worse, like a lot of filler is being utilized to extend the running time of something that could maybe be done in, say, 30 minutes. I can understand this criticism especially in this day and age where a lot of us need an explosion or a fart joke every 10 seconds to sustain us. But, especially as an introvert in high school, I identify and connect with these lengthy shots that often follow students between classes. I mean, what was more high school than bobbing and weaving down the halls in a couple of minutes to get to your next class? And whatever a person's opinion on the matter may be, this style is very distinct and unusual in the high school film dynamic. This gives Elephant a strong essence of originality that, love it or hate it, you've got to appreciate a director, especially of Gus Van Sant's caliber, playing with the elements in new ways. Also, by bogging down the viewer in the mundane activities of one's day, it almost makes you sleepily comfortable before the climax hits, and we are given a deep, dark reminder that, even on the most normal of days, it can all change and we can lose everything in a heartbeat. And so, if this general spot here right behind me would have been where John and his dad pulled in, pulled up and stopped, and the main entryway to the school is right about here. That means right over here, this big area right here, this would have been where the cafeteria was located, which primarily only serves prominence for three characters in the film. There's three girls that are, they're almost the classic, like they never stop talking, but they don't really talk about anything kind of how they've been described. So yeah, this would have been, again, you know, approximating based on where the entry is, where the car would have been parked, the entryway went right along the side of the cafeteria. So you would have walked along the side of the cafeteria up to the main entrance of the cafeteria, would have just, would have just been right here. Seriously, it's just, it's wild to think. If John pulls in and parks right here, right about where I'm standing now would be pretty close to where the main doors into the building would be that he would walk through he immediately comes inside he goes up to a phone that's right next to the main entrance so it'll probably be somewhere around here and calls I mean I've always assumed it's like a brother that he called saying hey dad's drunk can you come get him and then the principal comes out and asks him to step into his office so yeah, the entry, again, the entryway probably would have been 
you know, relatively close. See this, this little dirt path that breaks off. Probably about in line with this. So I'm just gonna uh, pop a squat in the, in the doorway to the school, at least, again, approximately. But again, if I'm off, I'm off by like five feet. You know, it's not like, oh no, dude, it was way over there. What the hell is wrong with you? I can at least use the remains of the old uh, little driveway in front and the gates that they would have come through as kind of a general guiding marker. And so this isn't just where, as I said earlier, John enters the school and you as a viewer actually finally go inside the school with uh, one of the characters. This is also, understandably, the way that the two school shooters come in at the end. And John actually walks out this main entrance. As he walks out, um, there's someone's dog runs up to him. That would have been like, you know, again, like right here. And he kind of twirls his hand and the dog tries to jump with him. And then you see from more kind of this direction, the shooters approaching him. And he asks them, what are you doing? And one of them says, uh, I believe he says, like, get the hell out of here. Some heavy shit's about to go down. And he watches as the shooters come up and enter the school. And that sets us up for kind of the, the big finale, the big tragic finale of the overall film. In a film with several focal characters, the character of John is still very much the lead role. We are introduced to him first. He's the only one of the main characters to, spoilers, not get killed. He even got to be the focus of the most promoted moment in the film. You're crying. Yeah. Is something bad? I don't know. I also love, side note, the background of this room. If there's any moment you can really tell this film was shot at a vacant high school, it's the setup in this room. This room is representative of the school as a whole. It may have been set up this way intentionally, making the school appeal very uh, minimalistic and bland to add to the mundane nature of life that is presented early on, but it also may have been due to the fact that a previously empty school was being used and the chunk of the budget had to be used to compensate for that. The film had a $3 million budget, but even in the realm of experimental film like this, that's a tiny budget that can vanish like that, so maybe they just didn't have enough to fill in the empty spaces. After John and Elias are brought into the fray, we are then slowly introduced to the other characters that are the focus of the story. We are taken to a field out behind the school where we first see Nathan, the, quote, athletic hottie. However, before we follow Nathan for several minutes, we are given a brief glimpse of Michelle, another reoccurring character in the film, and also one of the only characters in the film whose character's name was not also her real first name. Side story. So I'm uh, working in a movie theater. Uh, it's probably t 2009, I'd want to say, maybe late 2008, early 2010, but... 2009 is kind of the, the I want to say roughly when this happened. I'm working as a ticket taker. I got my little podium with me and I'm up at the front of the theaters of long lines, a bunch of people coming through and I'm the one person standing between them and getting in. So there's just a lot, lot going on. I'm super busy. I'm taking people, you know, tickets from all angles. And then all of a sudden someone walks in and I'm like, wait, where do, where do I know that person from? And after staring for a few seconds, I realized, personally, I didn't actually know this person. I only knew this person because I had seen them in Elephant. But yeah, no, the girl that plays Michelle in Elephant came in one night uh, to watch a movie. And of course, you know, most of these people that were in Elephant were locals. So this was not totally out of the norm that someone would walk into a Portland movie theater who happened to be an Elephant. And she actually came up to me and I'm just like, okay. <laughs> It's an interesting, interesting meetup. 
The near simultaneous introduction of Nathan and Michelle is intriguing as their life experiences are night and day. After following Nathan for a couple of minutes, where we already see other girls lust over him, he meets up with his gorgeous girlfriend. In the brief time that they talk, we can already firmly establish that he's a bit of a, how do you say, dumbass. But his girlfriend, Carrie, like in a lot of high school relationships, especially at that time, I know, I saw it, she just kind of goes along with it. Had they survived the day, I'm pretty sure she would have eventually broken it off with Nathan. That's just me, though. We see throughout the film, however, that Michelle is very much a loner with a deeply introverted personality. Again, something I can identify with. She's mocked in her PE class, and even later in the film, when she's doing library work, the way in which she's spoken to in the sequences gives off vibes that she's a troubled kid who the school is looking to help by giving her random tasks. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but let me just say, I used to fake sickness all the time in school, and my school became convinced that I was a troubled kid. And they literally forced me into a group, like this little program where we did little odd tasks like that. It worked. My attendance improved drastically. Uh, but it was mostly because I didn't want to be in that group anymore. When we first see these characters, they are in the vicinity of a running track surrounding a football field. Now, logistically, this would be the track and field that remain on the site to this day. But I'm still not 100% sure. The backgrounds, while showing locations separated by 18 years, don't match at all. I've always been bewildered by this, perhaps nonsensically so. So with the high school having been directly over here, this is Fernhill Park. This is reportedly, I've read that these are remains from school's past like this is the only thing from the original school that remains which is this football field and then there's a running track going around it this is essentially just park space now so it makes sense that they would have this left behind Now, there is a sequence in the film, and this is one of the things that kind of remains, it's eluded me, it remains kind of a little bit of a mystery to me, which is another character that's introduced is playing football in a field with some friends, um, but it's not, it's not this established. He pl plays football with some friends, and then he puts his lifeguard sweatshirt on, which the red lifeguard sweatshirts, which those were so popular when I was in high school. I don't really know why, I don't really know the story behind that. But as he walks away, the camera kind of pans with him and it implies that the place they're playing is just a little bit off center with the back side of the school. And again, it has to be presumed that he's approaching the back side of the school. It looks like the back side of the school, but he could be approaching the side. I don't know, because you, you'd think instinctively that that scene would have been shot here in this field. Um, and maybe it was, but the background, you can see a lot more trees. There's a lot more trees back here and there's a, there was like fencing um, up here. And the school would be over here. It, wouldn't, it doesn't really line up with this. So unless he was going in towards the side of the school, which again, in the film, it looks like the back side of the school, that would make sense coming from here. He'd be coming from here and then walking this way. But again, it looks like the backside of the school. So I'm almost more wondering if they were playing up over here, but there's less space up there. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm like, I don't know, maybe 60% thinking it was shot here. It would make sense. I mean, this is about where we would be in the film and I'm wondering does the background look anything like what it looks like in the film uh there was fencing there was there was a lot there was a higher concentration of trees which is what makes me think this is not because it would have been filming this direction 
So I don't know. Let's just say 70%, not 80, 90, I don't know. I really don't know. It's it's just, maybe it's just the, the magic of filmmaking that things look a little different on film than they do in person here. Well, and here's another thing. I don't remember him having to walk over a ridge to get to the school. I remember him actually kind of going downhill and then to the school. And there's a ridge here that you'd have to go up to, the school was up here. This is blowing my mind. I can't, if I, I can't find an answer. From here, we are then introduced to Acadia, who, after kissing John, goes to a class where they are all in the midst of discussing the question of if you can tell when someone is gay. It's a cringy scene, but so accurate to the time period. The film then takes a shift as John's character steps outside and we are introduced to the antagonists of the film, Alex and Eric. There are a lot of nuances to these characters. Alex is the only one we actually see getting bullied. We also see that Alex has an artistic side as he plays the piano while Eric plays a very archaic, by today's standards, looking first person shooter game. They also watch a Nazi documentary wherein they aren't even 100% sure who Adolf Hitler is. Is that guy? That's Hitler, right? Hitler. Also, can we take a moment to ogle Alex's home decor? We're given no real insight as to Eric's home life, as we only see him while he's visiting Alex's house or at school. In terms of the Columbine connection, it's always been the strong inference, for which there have been claims to the contrary, that Eric Harris was the leader while Dylan Claybold was more the follower. In this context, Alex is definitely the Eric Harris of the two while Eric is the Dylan Claybold. We watch as Alex formulates their plan and clearly knows more about weaponry between the two of them. He even, spoilers, executes his own friend at the end of the film. One of the most controversial moments, you know, in a film where a school shooting concludes matters, um, really shows how long ago this film was made. In this scene, it's the morning of the shooting, Alex gets into the shower where he is soon joined by Eric. The two then discuss how they've never even been kissed before, leading to the two beginning to kiss in the shower. Again, it was 2003. Homophobia is, clearly, still rampant now that we're in the 2020s, but it was something else back in 2003. Only a year after this film was released, even in left-leaning Oregon, Two measures to legalize gay marriage were voted down because even liberal states were still not totally cool with marriage equality at that time. So it totally made sense at the time for people to come out and go, Ugh, they always have to put something gay in these movies. Maybe they were in love with one another, maybe not. 
the notion of this is never fully established. So, you know what? How about we don't just judge in general? Okay, bruh? But upon the first reveal of Alex and Eric, there are still other focal characters yet to be introduced. We still have possibly my favorite characters in the whole film. BFFs Brittany, Jordan, and Nicole. We see them briefly early in the film when Nathan passes by them, but don't return to them till the middle of the film. For a time, we follow these three as they gossip about your classic high school drama. Uh, drama in and of itself, jealousy, parents, boyfriends. As they eat practically none of their lunch before collectively going to the women's room to regurgitate it. Little do they realize that this is the last thing they will do in their lives. The longest shot in the film tracks with these three characters, clocking it at 5 minutes and 21 seconds in length. While these are the primary characters introduced before the shooting event itself occurs, there is another character that we see briefly early in the film playing football. This is Benny, who we don't see again till the midst of the shooting event itself. He walks the halls, which are on fire, helps Acadia to escape the school before finally confronting Eric. So close. I remember the first time watching this film, and I was really hoping Benny would have pulled this off, somehow getting to Eric and disarming him. Because I kind of knew this guy. He went to Milwaukee High School, one of my high school's track rivals. Here's some video I got of him running track against my school. It was interesting that Benny is the only real character who shows heroism during the shooting, and yet he is given practically no backstory leading up to this time. We don't even hear him speak in the film. Again, with most of the actors having no background in film, most of the kids in it did little more acting work afterwards, with few exceptions. John Robinson, who plays John in the film, used Elephant as a springboard to a fairly successful career, including a breakout role in 2005's Lords of Dogtown. Carrie Finklia, who plays Carrie in the film, has also maintained a steady acting career since being an Elephant as well. And Alex Frost, Alex in the film, would also go on to have further success. This bullied kid from Elephant would ironically, go on to play the role of a school bully in 2008's Drillbit Taylor. What was very distinctive to me, particularly about Frost playing a school shooter, was his uncanny resemblance to Kiplin's Kinkle. Kinkle shot up his Springfield, Oregon high school, only about 100 miles from where I live, on May 21st, 1998 killing two and wounding 25, this was considered America's worst school shooting ever, only for the Columbine Massacre to eclipse that 11 months later. You see, briefly, in Elephant, a moment where Alex's character is hearing voices and appearing overwhelmed by them. Interestingly enough, Kinkle immediately claimed he heard voices in his head that drove him to kill. Alex's personality is also much more like Kip Kinkle than, say, Eric Harris, who was known to be loud and ultra-hostile. Maybe this is all a coincidence, but I get the feeling that Alex's resemblance to an Oregon-based school shooter from only a couple years earlier was not an accident. As far as I could tell, there were really two actors in the film that were recognizable at the time. Most notably, John's drunken father is played by actor Timothy Bottoms, whose career stretches all the way back to 1971. Bottoms' career had recently had a major revival in 2001 with his performance as President George W. Bush in the shortly-run Comedy Central series, That's My Bush. 
The principal of the school in Elephant was played by character actor Matt Malloy, whose career goes back to the late 1980s and includes films such as As Good As It Gets, Armageddon, Role Models, Morning Glory, and a long resume of television roles. Going down the cast list, I spotted a name I didn't recognize, a Larry Leverty, who apparently played teacher number three in Elephant. A small role for a guy with over 100 acting credits to his name, including work on The Matrix Reloaded and Nine Months. An interesting little find, if nothing more. But enough of these strangers. It's time for a fun little game called Spot All the People I Knew in This Film. Then again, you're probably not going to notice any of these people, so I guess you can't really play in little stories. Screw it, I'm playing. That guy, right there. He also was in my media communications program. I went to middle school with him as well. We had humanities together. I totally thought I was going to get American Studies Student of the Year because it was given by my favorite teacher, Miss Peachin, and she said, quote, this student has the best smile, and she was always telling me I could smile when I did well in class because... You know, I was antisocial and all. But nope. It went to that guy. Congratulations, you son of a bitch. But a nice guy. That guy there in the plaid shirt. Didn't know the guy. Just know that he went to high school with me. His sister was in my graduating class. And back to this clip I showed you earlier of the girl bragging about her Star Spangled Banner performance. Before we pan to her, we see this girl right here. I don't know this girl's name. I don't even know if she was in my graduating class, but I remember seeing her around my high school. She was impossible to miss with that little darkness of fluff over her head. But this here was my closest connection to the film. So breakdancing was a big deal at my high school, and we had some of the best. And three guys from my school actually appear in the film, breakdancing. I knew two of these guys pretty well as they were long jumpers with me during track season. These were Joe, seen here, and then this guy, seen doing this crazy shit right here. That's Cyrus. He was always doing that during track season. Showing off. Yeah, Cyrus. He was a fun guy. And that's it for Spot All the People I Knew in This Film. I'm sure there may be another person or two that I've forgotten, or some I've just never noticed who were in this film. I guess you could even include the girl who played Michelle, since we did technically meet once. Another harsh criticism some have for the film are the characters themselves, which is significant as the film is really about getting a feel for the people that are in it. But again, the argument is put forward that the characters are also boring. Again, I guess since they're not superheroes or Harry Potter, no offense if you love that kind of stuff, that I guess they aren't worth our attention. Cinema is about pacing and sometimes about making everyday life more exciting through the wonderful world of pacing and editing. If someone has to go an hour-long drive, you don't show an hour-long car drive. You show someone leaving, maybe a driving montage, and then their arrival. But Elephant flops that on its side by showing its characters in real time without the classic high school hijinks. But still, it's not just that these characters aren't someone else, but it's that lots of viewers don't feel invested in them. Again, I understand the boredom some may feel, but I can't identify with the lack of investment. Even the characters I don't particularly like, I remember from my high school experience. And a number of the elements I remember from school are ceaselessly present in this film. The clothes, the dialogue, even the look. My high school actually bore a very similar appearance to the school used in the film with the rocky exterior and bland interiors. All the cliques are represented as well, but they're presented as real people as opposed to facsimiles of their cliques. John is an obvious skater boy, of which those guys were like a plague at my school. 
You gotta realize my high school was hidden away from busy streets, so it was a rare spot skaters could go to and skate to their heart's content without getting run off. Elias is the artistic one with an alternative edge. I mean, look at that fork bracelet. Then you've got Michelle, who was a lot like who I was in high school. I mean, kinda. And even Alex, the mastermind, so to speak, was not to freak anyone out, but kinda like me, minus the whole desire to get revenge by killing people aspect. But seriously, at least in middle school, I was this guy. The matted hair, the baggy clothes, awkward way of communication. No joke, in middle school, I had four different people walk up to me and ask me if I was one of those kids that was going to come to school and shoot it up one day. I'm not kidding. And how do I know it was exactly four people? Because every time someone asks you if you're going to come to school and kill everyone one day, you don't forget about it. But at the same time, I understood. I looked and in some ways acted the part of the awkward outcast. The fact that another introverted brunette named Kip Kinkle shot up his Oregon high school right before I started middle school probably didn't help things. Oregon kids associated school shooters with kids who looked like Kinkle. And I kinda did. Overall, considering the total lack of experience among them, I was surprised at how well many of the leads did in the film, especially in instances of long takes where screwing up in the middle wasn't an option. An elephant, as with its structure and pacing, presents the high school student in a very direct and unique way. The film also forces us to pay attention to many of its characters in order to understand them. Despite being a film with minimal action and lots of dialogue, it's surprisingly restrained in terms of exposition. We don't need to see John's home life to know it's tragic. In Michelle's case, she has an issue of not wanting to show her legs, and in order to better understand why, you have to hear the faint dialogue of other girls in the locker room with her. And in the case of Alex and Eric, while there are some classic school shooter tropes like the playing of violent video games and the possible interest in Nazism, they are not presented as maniacal, bloodthirsty killers. And during this time of about 2002-2003, where school shootings were having their first boom, that was the attitude held by a lot of people because it was a new phenomenon to many. Even when Alex is giving Eric the rundown of their plans, it's done in a very passive way, and as the climactic shooting goes on, we see Alex almost realizing the implications of what he's doing. The longer it goes on, the more we see him flinch with every gunshot, almost like he's fighting that side that's telling him this is wrong. But then, by the end of the film, he kills his one good friend, and right before the credits appear, he seems clearly unshaken by his actions at that point. It seems he's had his first taste of killing, and he's discovered, in the end, that he likes it. I had taken a deep and personal interest in understanding school shootings, back when I was in middle and high school, especially after Kip Kinkle's actions in 1998. So, in watching Elephant, I got to connect with the school culture of the time, as well as taking in a cinematic recreation of a school shooting. It was the first time I'd seen such a thing done in film. I was still about a year from becoming more of a film buff. There's been an even greater explosion of school shooters in the past decade, a second discernible spike in such tragedies after the one that began in the late 1990s. It wasn't just Kip Kinkle, Eric Harris, and Dylan Claybold. It was Michael Carneal who shot eight fellow students who were having a prayer circle, killing three at his Kentucky high school on December 1st, 1997. It was Luke Woodham who, after his girlfriend left him, went into his high school in Pearl, Mississippi, shooting her and her friend dead exactly two months to the day before Carneal's shooting. It was Barry Lukaitis who opened fire on his algebra class in Moses Lake, Washington in February of 1996. It was Evan Ramsey who stormed through his Bethel, Alaska high school with a shotgun, killing two in February 1997. It was Mitchell Johnson and Andrew Golden who set off their school's fire alarm and picked off people as they evacuated their school in 1998. They killed five and wounded ten. These are the other cases I remember well, 
and all were predecessors to greater events like Columbine. Van Sant's film, I personally feel, came out at a critical time where much of the general public still understood little, really, about school shootings, and yet were hopelessly in fear of them. I'm eternally grateful that I never experienced an event such as this. I had a few close calls, a bomb threat when I was in third grade, a student caught carrying a gun at my college. I think the closest I came to at least possibly having a high school shooting happen at my school was during my junior year. A kid named Nick Texera, who'd reportedly been suffering with mental issues, had transferred to my school. While there were no implications he had intentions of doing something like a school shooting, he was a very explosive, troubled teen. On the night of January 9th, 2003, the police were called to Texera's home after screaming from the home could be heard from blocks away. When they arrived, Texera pulled a gun and shot one of the officers, Damon Coates, in the face, permanently disabling him. We were all shaken up at school after this event, but I was at least mildly glad to see that years later, Texera and Coates appear to have buried the hatchet. With numerous forms of art, film included, having been placed on a list of endless things to blame for the reasons why kids were going to their schools and shooting them up, Elephant, in and of itself, being what it was and what it was about, was also subject to possibly being blamed for driving kids to kill. On March 21, 2005, a 16-year-old named Jeff Weiss murdered his grandfather and his girlfriend, with whom he was living with in Minnesota. He then took up a collection of guns and went to the local Red Lake High School, where he shot dead a security guard before opening fire on a classroom, killing four. He then returned to the entrance area of the school, where he killed two more before engaging in a shootout with police. After being hit a couple of times, he fled to an empty classroom, where he committed suicide. Weiss had a difficult upbringing that included the suicide of his father and brain damage suffered by his mother after a car accident. He was then left abandoned by his stepfather, and this was all by the time he was at the age of 10. He was described as a quiet loner who wore a trench coat and was passively described as a, quote, goth kid. He'd attempted suicide in 2004, leading to a stay at a psychiatric hospital wherein he was prescribed the controversial drug Prozac. While this drug came under criticism, as Weiss had been given an increased dosage of the drug the week before the shooting, the film Elephant came under brief scrutiny in relation to the shooting as well. Weiss had apparently watched the film within a couple weeks of the shooting, and a friend of his claimed that he brought a copy of the movie over to watch, but just fast-forwarded to the ending, where they just watched the planning out and carrying out of the shooting. However, as we all should know by now, one little thing does not create a killer. Certainly watching Elephant could have been a catalyst to the Red Lake shooting, but it did not create the state of mind that Weiss was suffering under. Considering his upbringing, wherein he apparently struggled greatly dealing with all of his family trauma, especially his father's suicide, Jeff Weiss was a very troubled young man. Maybe Elephant helped give him a push but even if he'd never seen the film, he likely would have found another catalyst a little further down the line to help push him over the edge. Art alone does not drive one to mass murder. So after... The completion of the shoot, the cutting together, everything leading up to a final completed film. The film Elephant was first shown on May 18th, 2003, when it premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in France. Now, this jump started a, a succession of film festivals that the film was in over the course 
of 2003, uh, premiering in America, Canada, and countries all over Europe. But it didn't premiere until early October in America, when it was released as a very limited release, where only certain people were allowed to come, uh, you know, the actors in the film were allowed to come, people who were directly involved. And that premiere happened in Portland, which makes all the sense in the world. And it premiered at the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall, right smack in the middle of downtown Portland. It's where I graduated high school at. So that was when it was first premiered in the States, and logistically it was premiered in the town that it took place in and was filmed in. At least I think it, I don't remember if they ever said it actually took place in there, but it was filmed here. So... And it would officially be released in a more uh, wider spread theatrical release the following month, November 2003. In addition to winning three major awards at the Cannes Film Festival, uh, later on in December 2003, it won the award for Best Cinematography by the New York Film Critics Circle. And then a little while later, transitioning into 2004, in another uh, French film, the uh, French um, Syndicate of Cinema Critics, they said it was. And that, in that vein, in early 2004, Elephant won Best Foreign Film. So it actually won a few awards, and I think that definitely got it jump-started. In terms of critical reception, most major critics uh, were positively receptive to the film. I know Roger Ebert gave it a four out of four and acknowledged that the film is violent, but it doesn't take the violence and make it something exciting. It kind of takes all the life out of it so that you have just this, you just have this just dead violence that, that isn't spiked for the sake of cinematic enjoyment. It keeps it dark. And so it seems, that, again, general consensus was that this was a good film. Obviously, if you ask the general viewing public, the numbers are going to fluctuate more. But Elephant seems to, seems to hover around that 70% approval rating. They have a 7.2 rating on IMDb. As of the making of this film, it's had over 85,000 people rate it on IMDb, and it has a 7.2 there, which is pretty, pretty decent. Not legendary, but decent. Its Metacritic score is a 70 for reviewers, and it has a 7.2 score based on the ratings of the users there. And then finally on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 73% score. I guess that means it's fresh, as far as they're concerned. And it has a 79% audience score, which I was kind of surprised it was that high. And that is out of a total of almost 60,000 different people that have left ratings in there. So you can see there's, they're pretty close between like a 70 and a 73. Because the 7.2 is essentially the same as the 72 in terms of how IMDb scores it. So pretty solid approval with the occasional opposition. And what was definitely interesting was how much more successful the film was internationally. Then in America, again, being an American-based, American-produced film by a fairly well-known American director. But while the film had about a $3 million budget, they only got a gross of a one, or let's see, 1 .2 million, a little over $1.2 million gross. That's domestic in America. But gross worldwide, they did just over $10 million. So a substantial chunk of... The money that this film made was actually international. And it makes sense because it did appear in so many film festivals all over Europe. I'm sure Europe definitely helped boost those gross numbers. So in the end, it made a little over $10 million. So it did, uh, it technically made money because it was only a $3 million budget. It was never perfect. It was never going to move mountains, nor was it ever having that intention to do so. It wasn't retelling 
what happened at Columbine. It wasn't trying to make the greatest statement in the history of high school. It just wanted to take a different look at high school life and a high school life that I understood that I came from. I came from that era. So maybe I just feel it more than other people. Maybe I identify with it more because of that, because the high school experience changes with every generation. But for me, Elephant, love it or hate it, it had its purpose. It was what it was. And from my position, I'm so grateful that it exists.